was born in 1918, so I'm going to be talking about like 1925 to 1935, that uh, era. We, um, my uh, dad and mother and I lived with my grandfather, August Deprenner, and um, because of our German background, we had a, a large garden. We, um, we had lettuce and carrots and turnips and strawberries and potatoes. And had black and red raspberries and had a pear tree, three cherry trees. And our front lawn had a red cherry tree and a white cherry tree in that. So they used up all the land they could. And um, our home had a dirt cellar. So uh, that's where the potatoes were stored. That's where the canned fruit was kept. And then we had a big crock for sauerkraut. And the uh, sauerkraut was put in the crock. There was a wooden lid made that would fit inside the crock. And then a stone was placed on that. So you had your crock, wooden lid, stone, and that kept it compressed. And we could have fresh sauerkraut all, all winter long. Um, our home also had a uh, second floor apartment above you. originally, and that uh, had an outside stairway. Well, the outside stairway had been torn down, so um, we still had the entrance door, and that uh, went out on a sloped roof. Well, as kids, we could go upstairs, open the door, slip out onto the sloped roof, climb up the roof to the peak, and run up along the peaks of the roofs. Can you imagine the average mother letting her do that today? <laughs> I don't think I'd let my kids do it. Um, and in those days, every home seemed to have an old barn located on it. And those barns were used, uh, now they're used for uh, storing like kindling for this cook stove and uh, regular wood for the stove. Um, wheelbarrow and garden tools, uh, just a catch-all. Well, um, that, that second floor of a lot of those barns had a, uh, a uh, window that opened onto the alley. So that's where some of the boys play ending in through that second floor of barn and the alley because we're, I'll tell you about a game. <laughs> One of the first games that I remember was Andy Over. Mm -hmm. And most, maybe all of you remember that, I don't know. Anyways, one team would, we used either a tennis ball or a sponge ball. One team would be on one side of a barn. We had to have a barn that you could run all the way around. So one team would be over here and they would throw the ball up over the peak of the roof rolled on the other side, whoever got it would they would all run around and try to throw the ball and hit one of the players from this side. That when when that happened, then this side got the ball. If you missed, then this side kept the ball. And if they threw the ball and it didn't go over, you called pigtail. <laughs> <laughs> I imagine because of the um, the, um, one of the earliest memories I have of toys was the uh, one that we used when we played Cops and Robbers, which there enters in the um, second floor of the barn, because you could hide up there and somebody would come up the stairway or what have you, and you'd get your gun out. How far this guy shoots. I hit the wall. So, <laughs> so you had plenty of ammunition. Those are rubber bands. Um, that, of course, is made with old inner tubes. And um, then, if we were lucky, we would find a branch, make a slingshot out of the rubber up here, and um, 
put a leather pouch back here for the for the stone, and the stones were all available from the alleys because they were gravel alleys. You didn't have to worry about where you were going to find that. Um, scrap yard, uh, scrap wood was available um, from Connecticut's Lumber Company. It was located about two blocks from our house, and um, the uh, we go down there and. I don't know whether it was customary, but he would always give us scraps of wood. We'd tell him what we wanted to make, and then he would give us some scraps of wood. For that. And of course, the shingles end of things was all um, uh, provided in our own barns, because whenever a roof was replaced, people did not take the shingles to the dump. They put them, they stored them, they stacked them in the barn so that they would have to start their cook stove fires in the morning. So now, uh, my grandfather was a retired blacksmith, and he was my babysitter. I mean, from the time I remember, uh, he would he would take me places. And we had two blacksmith shops that were located just a block from our home, and um, one of them was his original blacksmith shop that. Now is right across from Pizza Hut, that building. Anyways, he would take us, take me um, to these uh, blacksmith shops, and I'd watch them shooting horses and making horseshoes and um, making wagon wheels and repairing wagon wheels. One of the things that impressed me was um, how they made the metal tire that. Uh, that fit over the top of a wooden wheel. Um, these wheels were large for wagons, farm wagons. And um, after the wheel was made, or they would bring one in that, that needed repair, the blacksmith would take a small measuring tool, a uh, wheel, and he would go around the perimeter of the wooden wheel. Then he would go over to his uh, strap iron and it was like maybe three or four inches wide and he would measure out that distance, cut it off, put put it in a bender till it became a circle. He would put the two loose ends in the forge and heat them up until they were red hot. Then he would pound them together and he would uh, basically weld that to a solid piece. Then he would get it hot. In the meantime, the wood wagon wheel is outside the shop on a, a platform or a box. It's a tank, really, about six foot by six foot, about two foot deep. That's filled with water. And on top of it is an egg crate um, idea with a handle that can, when you push the handle, this would drop down the water. The wagon wheel is placed up on top of this, and the steel rim was then brought out. Two men had long handles with an uh, idea like this, and they would pick up this rim, and they would walk out, put it on top of the wagon wheel, and then beat it down until it's in place. Immediately after it was in place, they would drop it into the water, that would shrink it into the wheel so it would not come off. And, um, so now that is where we had water to play with, with our next toy. <laughs> this, this is a homemade boat. Now the idea of this boat is you wind up the paddle. And I'm trying to think, I've got to be sure I wind it the right way or it might go backwards. <laughs> Let's see. I wind it this way. Now, when you put that in the water, of course, the water forms resistance, but watch. So it, it would move slowly and push the boat across the water. Homemade toss. Um, another thing we did, we made kites. And of course, in those days, we could go to the lumber yard and get a yardstick because they had yardsticks to advertise them, their uh, uh, name and address. And um, 
So these one inch by 36 inch pieces, we could cut those into narrow strips. And that would give us the, the crossbars for our kites. We made one that was just two sticks. And I, in this fashion right here, a diamond shape. And then we had a three stick where you had a crossbar and two this way. So you had these, like, I think it's maybe eight, an octagon, I'm not sure. I didn't, didn't look that up. <laughs> but anyways, the third group was a box kite. A box kite is a much larger kite, and it has a, it's, well, how shall I say? It is four, four sections with a piece of paper here, and on the other end a piece of paper, open in the middle, string that comes down through here. That type of kite was the strongest and would go the highest of any of the kites we had. But it was also a little tough because it would pull so hard in a strong wind it would break your string and away goes the kite. <laughs> <clears throat> then, uh, when we were flying kites, we would make a uh, parachute out of an old handkerchief or a piece of muslin, a piece of red sheet. And we would tie the four corners, a string to the four corners, and then put up bolts or some piece of weight on the bottom. And then we'd get a bent pin and put right through the top of the parachute. And when we were flying the kite, and there was some wind, we would walk down the kite string to about halfway to the kite, and we would place the parachute on the string. Then walk back, and it would. Now we've got the slope of the string and the kite up here, and the parachute here. The wind begins blowing this kite up towards the blowing the parachute up towards the kite. So before it gets to the kite, we want to release it. So we snap the string real hard, and that flips the parachute off, and down comes the parachute, and we go chasing after it. <laughs> so, now you, you wonder what's wrong with us today? <laughs> um, then we, had, we also had an early version of a skateboard. Um, skates had adjustments for width and length. And you had a skate key to adjust them so that fit any kind of shoe, a child or a more uh, a larger size. Well, anyways, we'd get a hold of a skate. Sometimes, if one skate was damaged or something, but we could get a hold of the other one. We'd take the skate apart, take the front wheel off, put them on a board that was about eight inches wide and possibly that long, and we could put the two wheels on the fasten them under here, the back wheels under here. Now we've got what today we would call a skateboard. Then we put a upright with braces and a crossbar. Now we've got a scooter. So all we need to do is pedal this skateboard scooter and we're in business. That was, that was uh, I don't know whether it was before the two wheel scooters, but at least it cost a lot less money. Than <laughs> And um, another game was uh, marbles that we played. Uh, marbles consisted of either clay marbles or glass shooters. And uh, uh, a person would, would take a glass marble and place it on, on, a, on the sidewalk. And he would sit behind it, spread leg, and then the Participants would get over on the uh, 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 sidewalk block away with their clay marbles. And they would roll these marbles, trying to hit the glass marble. If they hit the glass marble, he lost it. He got the clay marbles. And it's amazing how many clay marbles he collected before he, <laughs> someone hit the glass marble. Um, what was the old knuckles? There down. were. I what's remember it? we used to hour playing marble knuckles down. Yeah, you remember? That's, I could not remember how that game was played. Yeah. You had a circle, yeah. and you put a, a, a big marble in the middle, and then you would shoot these yeah. mm -hmm. glass. Normally you could stand up and go like that, but every once in a while there was, I know, so big yellow knuckles down, and you had to, you had to shoot had to your knuckles on the clip. You couldn't get the power. <laughs> That's right. Well, 
Now then there was, I shouldn't mention this, but it's all adults, so it's okay. <laughs> <laughs> we, had, we had two games of things that we did with old-fashioned matches, the, the, the stick matches. And um, one of them, you take a newspaper and you take the four corners of it and pull it down together and then twist that into a, a ball. After we got it back, we would set it on the grass and we'd take a match and we would light all four corners of this parachute. Now. Light these four corners. The flames would come up and would uh, consume the paper, but it would leave the ash so that it's just like a canopy of ash. Then the flames began working downward until they got down to the ball or twisted part. That gave us hot air, and away went the parachute up in the air, and all we did is hope, don't land on a roof. <laughs> they usually didn't go that high. Um, well, that, that, that was the, uh, the two matches. The other thing we did, involved carbide. Now, I don't know how many of you people know what carbide is, but carbide was used before electric headlights in cars. They had carbide headlights. And carbide was a little like rock salt. It, uh, it was in, in pieces like that. So we would get a uh, coffee can, and uh, usually a one-pound coffee can. And at the bottom on the side, we would pound a nail in through there to make a hole. Now we've got this can, we would put a piece of carbide in it, put a little water on it. In those days the cans had metal lids. Put the metal lid on top, wait a little bit, hold a match to this hole at the bottom. Carbide and water creates explosive gas. Wow. Quite a bang, dude. The lid went up maybe 30 feet high. In the air. <laughs> Um, one summer, uh, two boys and I decided that um, we wanted to make red beer. My mother was gone, so I furnished the wash tub that always hung out on the grape harbor outside. I can imagine how clean these things were. But anyways, we got the wash tub, brought it into the kitchen, and started with the mix and the water and all this and stirring and what have you. About that time, my mother came home. <laughs> the kitchen was a mess. We had, we had empty ketchup bottles because those were easily available from, from canning. And that's what we were going to put the root beer in, ketchup bottles. But she got home luckily before then. <laughs> We took a look at the whole thing. I don't believe we even got any root beer uh, bottle at all. <laughs> it might have all been taken out and tossed in the, in the grass. Um, the, um, I'm not sure when margarine came into existence, but when margarine first was used, they would not allow you to color it. It had to be white. It came in packages like um, like butter comes in, but it was white. And I was over to the neighbor's house one one noon, just before uh, lunchtime, and I saw them put this white stuff out in a in a butter dish. So I went home and I told my mother. I said, the neighbors use lard on their. <laughs> <laughs> So later on, they allowed, uh, allowed them to sell a capsule, a uh, coloring capsule, with the margarine. And uh, the uh, lady would put a, the, the margarine in a bowl and add the capsule and stir and stir and stir until she got that all worked up to look like butter. Then she had to mold it back into shape and put it on that. Mothers were a lot busier uh, at home than... <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm, going to, I'm going to touch on the depression. Um, I can only speak from my personal experience, but 
1929, the American Radiator Company, and that, by the way, was the only, the only uh, industry that we had in Bremen, um, located down here, of course, across the tracks, um, which largely is uh, empty space and where the um, grain elevator is. That area was all American Radiator. Uh, including the sidings because they, that's how they ship their uh, products out. Anyways, 1929 depression, they said, we're moving the factory to New York. They dismantled the factory, all, of, all the machinery, put it on freight cars and bingo. It was gone and the town just simply folded up. There was nothing. Men were very happy if they could get paid a dollar a day to go out and do farm work or manual labor. And um, uh, then in 1932, the uh, United States went on a uh, off the gold standard. And I, it's hard for me to comprehend. And my, I'm sure I'm right, the gold was $16 an ounce and it went to $32 an ounce. 1932. What is it today? It's in thousands. So I, I, I'm <coughs> sure they still use the same, <coughs> the same measurement of, in, in right. gold ounces. But anyways, um, when we were at the gold standard, uh, that was a time that our class was buying class rings, and very few of us could afford gold. And so we ended up with sterling silver uh, um, class rings. Um, and this also was the era of the WPA, the Works Project Administration. And to this day, if you walk around Bremen, you will find a tremendous amount of sidewalks that were built by the WPA. Along with, there was many, I think there were sewer projects, I know there were sewer projects School also. Or Bremen uh, Elementary School has a big plaque in there. It was built for the WPA in 1930-something or other. Okay. Well, I, I remember the and The men were so thankful to be on that because if you were not working, then you had to be on relief. And of the two things, you would prefer to be working for a dollar a day than having to say that, well, the relief is supporting me. So, um, uh, this, uh, this, this brought up then one of the things that was used to save money, and that is rubber soles for your shoes. Now, how many here know about rubber soles to put on your shoes? Well, then maybe it isn't so, maybe it isn't so old as I think. <laughs> to those of you who do not know, you would. Your shoes are worn, got a hole in the, in the sole. You'd buy this kit, which contained a tube of adhesive, two, a pair of rubber soles, and you bought them to the proper size for your shoes. They had them in all sizes. And the rubber soles had a paper back. So now you paint the adhesive on the leather sole, set it aside, let it age a while, then you peel the paper off the rubber sole, you place it on the sole, the leather sole and smooth it down good. You've got a pair of shoes now that you can wear for quite a while with rubber soles, not get your feet wet. <clears throat> um, as I grew a little older and became a little more uh, active with uh, hammer and saw, I began making um, lawn ornaments. And the, the lawn ornament that we started with, or I started with, was of a little girl with a bonnet on in an apron, and she was leaning over watering flowers. This had a, a spike in the bottom, and it was made out of three-quarter inch uh, lumber. So that would be placed near the uh, plantings of flowers, and as people drove by, you see the lady out here watering flowers. That was a long ornament. Well, um, a friend of mine, two years older, Bob Pepper, who was quite artistic, 
And he said, well, I think I could draw some of these other characters like Mickey Mouse and uh, comic characters, and uh, you could make those. So we went in business together. He was the artist and I was the, the saw man. <laughs> we made these different uh, lawn ornaments. And at that time, if you recall uh, where uh, Woody's parking lot is now, across the street is a large brick home. That was owned by William Lehman Sr. That's where their children all grew up. Across the street, they had a beautiful clay tennis court. And the backstop and the net ran parallel with road six. And so uh, Bob and I would take our lawn ornaments and put them out in the tree lawn. At that time, uh, 1933, the World's Fair was in Chicago, and Road 6 had been completed just uh, prior to this time. So there was a lot of traffic going through. In fact, I recall two different bus lines stopping here in Bremen every day, taking people to Chicago. So uh, a little different than, than today. Um, anyways, the... Um, um, I lost my chain of thought. We'll come back. Wait a while. Lawn ornaments. Okay. Um, so we started making these Mickey Mouse and different uh, figures to have them for sale. One day a man stops. He says, uh, uh, Who has the lawn ornaments for sale here? I'd like to talk with them. So he comes over well-dressed. You make these hard moments? Well, he says, you stop immediately because if you don't, Walt Disney is going to sue you for infringing upon his copyrights. <laughs> <laughs> that ended our first business. <laughs> and I know, I'm sure that he was a representative of Disney. He wasn't just some passerby, but uh, he, he had to use a little of his authority, and he sure, he sure put us out of business. <laughs> and, um, um, uh, now we get into dating, high school dating, and I think it was, I think it was different than it is today. I have no idea how it is today, but I, I do know how it was then. And the most popular idea of dating then was going for a stroll. You and your girlfriend, and usually it was two couples, would walk around town. We would spend hours just walking around town. And, uh, once in a while we would walk all the way out to the cemetery. And uh, on Sunday afternoons, once in a while, we would go down to the depot on Center Street and on the uh, railroad right away, We'd walk out to what we call the Forks. That's where this, the army ditch that goes through Bremen joins the Yellow River out here. And that's called the Forks. So we would walk out there, turn around, come back. It was something that occupied a lot of time. We enjoyed it. It probably was good for us. Um, now, uh, Spend a nickel for a Coke. What's that? <laughs> you spend a nickel for a Coke, maybe something at a pond eater, so something in there. If, if we had the nickel, yeah. <laughs> um, the, um, the high school uh, sponsored two social groups. The ladies, the girls group was called the uh, Girl Reserve, and the boys group was called High Y. So these, uh, the sponsors of these two groups got together and they said, let's, let's get these two groups together for a bunco party. So we had on St. Patrick's Day a bunco party and they paired Gretchen and I together. I don't know whether there was any particular reason except <laughs> at that time uh, Gretchen and I were at least involved in music. Uh, we knew each other through music and it may be that uh, one of the sponsors thought that, that well, that will make a good combination, put that together. <laughs> and the, the, um, the uh, different organizations in town 
would would ask for um, programs, music programs, and so Gretchen uh, and I got involved in, uh, since we we played trumpet, trumpet and trombone duets. So they would invite us to say the Kiwanis Club to be the music in the program, or we'd go to the Current Events Club and, and in the afternoon, and we would play for them. Uh, churches would ask us to uh, participate in their Sunday uh, worship with uh, a number. So we were put together in a number of uh, occasions, and I guess we got to know each other enough that we, <laughs> we decided that we liked each other. And, uh, so that was a, a good combination. When you, when you had an instrumental, you always had to have a piano, piano accompanist. Well, the accompanist, that gave you a chance to get away, and now you were just you and your girlfriend and the accompanist. Well, that was almost a date, and at least we could plan a future date <laughs> <laughs> a time like that. So, music, music gave us a lot of things, and uh, one of them was a good background for future dating. Well, then, at the same time, there was a... Um, dance band was formed by Mr. Creel Judy. He was a um, he was a foreman actually in the American Radiator Company and um, he also taught instrumental music. He, he directed the choir in our church. He played violin uh, every Sunday in our church um, for the uh, opening and for offertory and so on. Anyways, he, uh, uh, he decided to get these high school students now that, you see, back in, I don't know whether it would have been about 19, maybe 1930, maybe, maybe before, maybe before the Depression, we had the typical um, um, band man come to town, sell the school board, you need a school band. The next thing, he sells the instruments, to the people. He has them come in and demonstrates and the next thing you know you've walked home with with the instrument <laughs> that your parents will have to pay for if they approve. <laughs> and so in that way we, we got our instruments and the band was started with with a lot of a lot of uh, noise. Uh, Mr. Trudy decided that in this group, we picked out a few of us, we're going to have a dance band, and the first rehearsal happened to be at our house. My mother and dad were both sang in the choir and they lived just a half a block from Mr. Judy, so it was convenient. We had two living rooms in our house, or in our home, so it was convenient to put everybody in the maybe 12 people and a piano. In, in this area. Well, that first rehearsal, my mother and dad said that they went upstairs <laughs> and held their ears. <laughs> <laughs> I can just imagine. <laughs> but, uh, 12, 12 people that were just learning how to play. <laughs> but anyways, uh, we did mature and we became a dance band that played for dances up here, uh, where they, <clears throat> on the corner of the end of the first block on East Plymouth there, on the north side, <coughs> there was a large garage there, and the uh, second floor, I have no idea what it was used for originally, but had a nice smooth floor, like a, like a dance floor. So that's where the uh, dances were held, big long wooden stairway to get up there, and uh, I think they charged 25 cents admission for the evening. And on one end, they built a stage so the orchestra could be here, and a lot of room for, and chairs all the way around the room. Uh, not only the young people came, but uh, a few of the parents would come, and they enjoyed listening to music, but they also were sponsors and seeing that, that everything was, was going along fine. And it was, it was a very wholesome place for the kids to come, and uh, it attracted people from other 
towns, other high school students from other towns to come in. So um, uh, it was it was entertaining and it was a good background for Gretchen and I later in life because Gretchen became a professional musician and and for three years traveled all over the East Coast uh, uh, and Canada with an all-girl orchestra and. Um, I spent my time with uh, uh, dance bands and the theater. I, I was fortunate. Uh, when I was a senior in high school, my uh, uh, instrument instructor from South Bend uh, called me and he said, uh, could you uh, bring your horn and come to South Bend to the Palace Theater and be there at, at my certain time of day. Sure. So I I drive over and um, they have me sit down in the pit orchestra alongside the trombone player. Now it just so happens that the particular vaudeville, by the way vaudeville in those days was very popular. The theater had a full-time orchestra. Anytime there was a vaudeville act on stage, there was a full-time orchestra down below to open the show, to close the show, to participate whenever there's any need for the uh, actors. And so this particular time, there was a comedy team by the name of Olson and Johnson. I'll never forget that. Um, Olson and Johnson were a team, and if you recall, this old, old comic routine of who's on first and, and second, so on. They originated that. Well, anyways, they were the greatest comics, and they did everything, um, how do I say, not verbatim, I mean, it, just, there was no routine to it. Whatever came into mind, the other one knew the answer, and they went ahead with that. And so it was just one constant pattern going on and, and it was fun. In fact, one of the one of the funniest things that opened the show, the very first thing, man, we play an opening act and everything is quiet. All at once. Paging Mrs. Jones. <laughs> Here comes a guy with a flower pot. Walking down the aisle. Well, he disappears and paging Mr. Jones. Here comes a guy with a tree. <laughs> Each time they're walking down there with a bigger pile. That's that's the way the show opens. <laughs> this Olson and Johnson, they gave us a list, our music of course, and opposite this music was a cue phrase like went to town, or whatever the phrase is. So they would be talking along here, their jokes and going along, and all at once, went to town. We had to play. The orchestra plays a number, stops, they go back into their routine. I throw the paper on the floor and I look for the next one. And here comes this one, up the whole way. I went through that. When I ended up, there was 12 sheets of paper on the floor. <laughs> music. But, um, that was my introduction uh, professionally out of my local Bremen group. And I was fortunate. They liked it well enough that they hired me as a substitute uh, trombonist. And uh, whenever the, the, the trombonist, the regular trombonist, played for a nightclub, so the two evening shows, he could not be there. So that was my job. So I would come in and sit and watch the morning shows so I would know what's going on. And then I would be there to, to participate in the two evening. Well, I brought you up to, I'm, I graduated in high school in 1935. I joined my father in the fur business. Gretchen joined her mother in the retail uh, Business as Easter's Variety Store. That's it. Oh, I'd like to show you a couple things. How many people know what this is? 
or have seen it. <laughs> oh, yeah. Sarah, you don't count. <laughs> and Suzanne, you don't count. <coughs> I, get back. <laughs> I made this years and years ago, and the um, the uh, Suzanne was fortunate enough to save it. Um, this is the dark. No, there's nothing there. I'm going to go 20 or 30 feet in the air. When it comes down, the torch comes down, and this thing sticks in the grass. You recover, start over again. But that's made from one of those shingles that was left over from when the new roof was put on. And then, of course, I showed you this one. That's the, the boat that was used in the uh, water tank. This kite string. Oh, and when you you know when you put that parachute up, you had to have two people because one had to hold the parachute uh, hold the string while the other walked down the, the string. If for some reason or other you accidentally dropped this, and it your kite immediately started going with the wind, but this thing was. <laughs> Flying across the grass, you could run after it and grab it if it was just a string in your hand. And so they, they were very practical. Um, this, I think originally must have been made by adults. I can't imagine me as a child making one, but. <laughs> How do we do that? Kinetic energy. Okay. Another toy, another homemade toy. Any questions? I'll try to answer them if they have them. You just brought up about two living rooms, which reminded me. We called the one the parlor. And that's the only time you used that when you had company or something special. Us kids, we never dared even go into the parlor because it was always just so and fixed up for and company. Yeah, right. 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 Mentioned it to you, but uh, airplanes too is a oh, big thing to make. One more thing here, a couple more things. Does everybody know what this is? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yeah, and then you pull it. Yeah, yeah. I forget what they call those though. Yes. No, that didn't that didn't cost much either. No. <laughs> in fact, in fact, the string would probably come from the butcher shop where they wrap the meat. This is something that I remember playing with, and maybe all of you have been exposed to a, a gyroscope. But set it down. Have all of you, all of you are familiar with that. Okay. Oops. Oops. Oh, that? Can you reach the same? Tell us it's Can you reach it? Yeah. Tell us about the first shot. Yeah. Well, I didn't want to bore you like that. <laughs> and just, yeah, it's kind of just, just how much time do you want to spend here? I mean, <laughs> Well, if they start to leave, we can quit. <laughs> I'm just going to say, we might have to do like the Bible and feed the 5,000. <laughs> Has anybody got some fish? In <laughs> well, before I do that, I'm going to show you one other thing. This is a rubber band inside. There's a hook on here. You put this in here and you twist. Twist till you, till you get a hold of the rubber band and then 
<laughs> so if any of you want to try that, it's there for you to try. Uh, well, Pat, what do you want to know about the first job? How it started or? Yeah. Well, and tell about your father was the sheriff in town. What? Your father was the sheriff in town? Well, he, was a, he was the town marshal. Town marshal. Yeah. Well, there again, that's, this is, uh, all goes back to depression. I remember the only time in my life I ever saw my father cry, shed tears. I went into the living room one day and here he was sitting in a rocking chair just to cry. He had, he had been dismissed from the American Radiator Company. They were very, he was very fortunate in as much as they told him that they wanted him to move to New York with the five three, and mother said no. So uh, uh, they said they told dad if he stays with the company uh, for uh, dismantling it and getting all this stuff put on the freight cars, they would continue to pay him. And then when he finished that job, they would give him six months severance pay, which I thought was. That was pretty, well. a pretty good thing for uh, for this depression when when people didn't have any money. But anyways, it was after that six month period that my dad was now out of work, out of no more income, and and that's like I say, the first time I ever, the only time I ever saw him cry. But anyways, uh, soon after that particular occasion. The local marshal here passed away, and they needed to hire a new man. Dad had been in the Navy um, as a very young man. His mother had to sign, sign him in. Um, and he was fortunate enough to uh, be on the President's yacht all the time he was in service. He was uh, two years with um, Teddy Roosevelt, and then the remainder time with uh, Howard Taft. But anyways, um, he came home from the uh, Navy then. He um, had worked at the foundry and had become a foreman. So uh, he had a nice job. And of course, a really hurts. Well, anyways, the, now they needed a new police or a marshal. And since Dad had a Navy background, they gave him first choice. Well, he jumped at the chance to become a policeman. And uh, from then on, my father was, was a policeman for quite a few years. I, I don't remember exactly how many. In the meantime, he had decided that he knew he was going to be out of work. And he had a background of tax attorney. He was a sportsman, so he had mounted animals, birds, fish. So uh, he had the equipment the sewing machine to do fur work. So he uh, enrolled in a correspondence course of fur craft that would teach him how to repair furs and uh, make new furs, new fur coats, fur garments. So he, he would get a, a booklet and he would follow the instructions, do these things, and then he would send his finished pieces back to the one child. They would look them over and he would tell them how he could improve or approve what he did. He went through the whole book of this, and at the end they suggested that uh, he uh, that people should start a fur storage because people needed to take their furs out of the closets in the summertime because with a lot of wool clothes being worn, moths were prevalent, and they would get into the furs. Well, you bring them to the storage, and they won't get any moths in them. So um, Dad ended up building a small vault, 12 foot by 20 foot, two tiers high with racks. And that would had 12 inch walls so that it would stay cool and um, that's where we stored the furs, and that was right adjoining our, our home. <clears throat> um, so now he's a policeman. 
these out. So in the meantime, in the summer, we would uh, band concerts would be held in the various towns. I think ours was always on a Thursday night. But anyways, the night of band concert, Dad and I would take, uh, uh, he had full uh, sheets made up advertising that he operated a fur shop and fur storage and did repairs and remodeling of furs. And uh, so we would put those in cars. You know, and there was still, most cars were open enough, either a window down or not even a window, uh, and you, you put them in. Uh, so uh, we would go distribute these. And we did that to uh, other cities. And Dad also went to uh, Plymouth, I remember in particular. He told me, he went door to door, he would knock and say, I'm opening a fur shop in Plymouth, and if you have any furs, I'd like to have you take care of them, and so on and so on. He said, it was so humiliating to have people slam the door in your face in those days, but it happened. Um, all right, so now he's a police officer, and I think at that time their shifts were 12 hours. Um, the police car consisted of your own car, and um, <clears throat> they did put a siren in the car and a pull-down visor that said police in red, red letters, and that had a 1933 Ford V8, real mm -hmm. sharp car, with, with suicide doors. <laughs> <laughs> um, that was the police car, as well as our, our family car. Um, in the meantime, Dad had taken this course and had started, a few people would bring them in, and as I was growing up, uh, he would have me do the cleaning of the furs, uh, which we did upstairs in the second floor of this of our home, and the living room was our uh, waiting room for the customers to come in. They came in through our front door, sat down on our davenport, and told us what they needed, and everything was quite homespun in those days, uh, a ma and pa business. But in 1940, we uh, built our first. Um, shop adjoining the uh, building, and in 1935 I, I joined Dad, and at that time there was a, uh, uh, the, the results of polio. Polio left a lot, a lot of people uh, handicapped with a, uh, a high shoulder, a, a lump of, on the back, one hip much higher than the other, and that's, that was the way they, they ended up as adults. And these people were now of uh, age where they were uh, working in offices as stenographers and so on. And so they needed warm clothing, and fur coats was, was in the, at those days, a fur coat was more practical in dollars than um, uh, a cloth coat. The reason being, the um, a cloth coat eventually the front edges are going to get frayed and the sleeve ends are going to get frayed. That happens with furs, but you bring it into the fur room and he takes off all the old and he puts fresh fur on those spots and renews the coat. It's good for another five, six years. So um, the um, People that that our first customers were were school teachers because they had to walk to school. They had lake playgrounds <coughs> on the outside in the winter time, and they were the ones that needed warm clothing. And again, practical. You had a one of the coats that was most popular was a sheared rabbit. Now I have to go back a little bit and. <coughs> By the way, you can ring this bell because this could go on for days. 